Almost everyone can agree on the events that unfolded at Chernobyl. It is an established fact that at 1.23.39, the AZ-5 button was pressed, and the control rods began to descend into the reactor. The graphite displacers attached to the bottom of the control rods displaced water in the lower 1.25 metres of the reactor, causing a sudden and dramatic increase in power at the bottom of the core. What nobody can agree on is what happened after 1.23.44 a.m. Some form of explosion tore the building apart, but the nature of the explosion remains unknown. Countless theories have been suggested. These are just a few of them. This video is a much more scientific approach to the accident, and one from a world-famous Chernobyl physicist. Alexander Sitch was the first US nuclear engineer to have the opportunity to go to the Chernobyl exclusion zone to examine the accident, spending more than 18 months there, recreating the events that occurred in the reactor and the 10 days following. These findings were published in his thesis, Chernobyl, Accident Revisited. This theory of the explosion is generally regarded as one of the best, and so I thought that people might be interested in hearing how many scientists agree that the explosion occurred and the build-up inside the reactor beforehand. And therefore, we will be examining Sitch's theory of the accident today. We begin a second after the AZ-5 button is pressed, and the state of the core is already dire. Reactivity has grown from 200 to 320 megawatts of thermal power. The decrease in water entering the core has caused the accumulation of voids within, increasing the rate of reactivity faster than the automatic regulator control rods can suppress it. And now, inserting the control rods is only going to make the situation worse. As the control rods enter, the graphite displacers begin to displace water at the bottom of the core, greatly increasing the rate of fission. But the control rods are moving so slowly that they cannot reduce reactivity at a great enough rate. At the same time this is happening, the main circulation pumps running down during the experiment were disconnected. This resulted in a sudden decrease even further of the water entering the core, resulting in yet more voids forming within. As the positive void coefficient increases, the number of neutrons also increases until it reaches a reactivity rate of one dollar. Now, for those who aren't aware, the dollar system is calibrated such that zero dollars is a steady rate of nuclear fission, and one dollar is equivalent to prompt criticality. In other words, Chernobyl Reactor 4 has reached the point of a complete power excursion. This surge in power caused a further expansion of the gases released by the byproducts of the fission reaction and the boiling of coolant water is actively forcing water out of the core, only accelerating the fission even more. The increase in power is now so rapid that the measuring devices cannot keep up. The reactivity recorded by the computers is just 530 megawatts and accelerating. However, the real value was likely closer to 3800 megawatts of thermal energy and it is at this point that the reactor's first peak of reactivity is unleashed. The expected maximum thermal output of an RBMK reactor operating at 100% of power is 3200 megawatts. According to the calculations used by Alexander Sitch, at this second the reactivity attains a power output of 345 gigawatts. The very fuel that comprised the inside of the RBMK reactor was fragmented, shattered into a million pieces, and further drove up the pressure until the RBMK itself reached a breaking point. The upper biological shield, or as it is nicknamed, Yelena, was forced upwards momentarily, a very small distance likely less than a meter, 
The tops of the channels, the weakest parts of the entire coolant loop, due to the weak steel to zirconium welds, failed and severed along the entire reactor. A large volume of steam was shot upwards through the reactor hall and into the rest of the building, as Yelena fell back down in place. The entire reactor system had failed. Destruction was inevitable. With the loss of steam from within the reactor, the voids in the core would have momentarily collapsed. Momentarily. This was halted when the force of the pressure inside the reactor caused the backflow valves to seal. No more water could enter the core, and therefore more voids were formed, and a second neutron pulse occurred. Reactivity spiked to 1480 gigawatts of thermal energy. With this massive spike in pressure flooding the entire coolant loop, the steam relief valves of the steam separators would have opened, venting as much steam as possible into the atmosphere. This would not have accomplished much, however, as the pressure literally shattered the coolant channels inside the reactor, forcing the fuel and water into the graphite blocks, and, simultaneously, threw Yelena upwards into the air, severing the remaining worlds and rendering the entire reactor exposed to the air. With the loss of pressure inside the reactor, as the force was exerted outwards from the hole that was once the top of the reactor, the backflow valves reopened, allowing the last of the water still flowing through the coolant loop to re-enter into the remains of what was the reactor core. This set forward the last chain of events that destroyed Reactor 4. The reintroduction of already superheated water onto the glowing hot graphite and fuel would cause all of the water to instantaneously flash into steam. But we are talking about the greatest steam release, and hence the most powerful explosion of all of them. More intense than the release of steam at 1.2344, and more force than when Yelena was thrown upwards. It is this explosion that destroys the roof of the building, causes the collapse of both the north and south walls, and shoots fuel upwards into the atmosphere. Chernobyl Reactor 4 has been destroyed. Subsequent hydrogen explosions may have occurred, but it is unknown if any did happen due to a lack of evidence as it would have been concealed by the major explosion inside the reactor. This theory is by far the most recognised in the scientific community, in competition with the hydrogen explosion. Now, I have problems with both of these theories, however, but I will only touch on Sitch's theory today. The first of the two issues I will touch on is that the lower biological shield is only melted in exactly one third and collapsed into the rooms beneath the reactor. According to Sitch, the fuel remained inside the core after the explosion, yet today the core is empty and the lower biological shield has dropped. Sitch's explanation is that the fuel pooled in the melted third of the reactor and then melted through into the space below where it melted the steel support pillars and caused the lower biological shield to drop. It makes no sense for the reactor fuel to magically pile together in a perfect third of the reactor space, nor for the fuel to melt all four of the walls at a perfect rate for the lower biological shield to descend almost vertically instead of on one angle. I hope this makes sense. The second issue is the amount of fuel within the reactor building. According to Sitch, 135.2 tonnes of fuel was able to escape out of the bottom of the reactor to form all of the corium structures below. The only issue is that these calculations were based on data gathered using poor equipment and at a time when Chernobyl research was struggling due to low funding, meaning they have to be further verified in the future. Equally, this calls into question how 135 tonnes of pure nuclear fuel was able to get below the core in the first place, 
some people suggest that all of it was sucked into the core through the hole in the lower biological shield. However, this cannot be the case because the hole wasn't formed until several days later, in the Sitch theory anyway. The initial explosions aren't powerful enough to cause it, despite being at a power of 1480 gigawatts of thermal energy. We also have the problem of disappearing graphite, as very little graphite from within the core has been located. Despite the fuel being jammed into the graphite, as mentioned earlier in this theory's version of events. The mystery of what happened to the graphite in general may never be definitively explained. And that about sums up Sitch's theory of the Chernobyl explosion. Of all the major theories, this is perhaps my second favourite. It is definitely the best definite explanation in modern scientific journals, and I hope this retelling has given you the greatest understanding of the events in the last few seconds of Chernobyl Reactor 4. I hope you all learned something today.